good afternoon. Welcome to our Songs of Praise. Lovely to see you all. My name is Sheena Glanville. I'm one of the members here and I'll be leading the service this afternoon. And various people are taking part as usual. And then Philip will be bringing God's word to us a bit later on. So welcome. Today we're doing the fourth in our series about God's big picture. And this, this week, this month, sorry, we're doing Pentecost. And we've called the service The Room. As you'll remember, we've done the hill and other little descriptions previously. So we're talking about Pentecost because it's Pentecost Sunday next week, isn't it? Okay, so we're coming to praise God. It's called Songs of Praise. And there's a, there's a lovely song I used to sing years ago, and I couldn't find it when I was looking. But basically it keeps saying, how can I keep from singing? When I think about all that God has done for me, how can I keep from singing? So I just want to start with a prayer in the Celtic tradition, which sort of echoes that thought. So let's just come before God in prayer. Dear Lord, in this place where prayer has been made for many years, in this place where so many different people have found their common bond in your call and purpose, in this place where the walls are waiting to echo your praise, gracious God, how can we keep from singing? Therefore, with the church throughout the world and in fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we will sing the songs of your everlasting praise. Amen. And we're going to start with one of the good old belters, as we used to call them. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And then after that, John and Di Tuttleby are going to come up and share with us. So let's stand, if we're able, and sing Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing the Lord's praise. Oh, 
Afternoon. For those who don't know, I'm Di, and this is my husband John. Um, some of you will will know that we spent over 30 years in the Republic of Ireland, and we went in 1981, believing we had a call from God. And we've been asked to share this afternoon a little bit, just a little bit of how we knew that it was God who was talking to us and telling us by his spirit to go, because Pentecost reminds us the coming of the Holy Spirit, um, and he speaks to us in different ways. In many ways, the idea that we would get a call to the Republic of Ireland was not very sensible. We were in our 40s, just, and we had four children, aged 10, 8, 6, and 3. Um, so it was going to be a big move. We were in Chelmsford in Essex. Um, we lived in a council house in Chelmsford, and John worked as a hospital biochemist in London. We had met at, as students at Missionary Training College and had been on two mission trips to the Republic of Ireland 13 years earlier. So then in 1979, we read an article in a missionary magazine by a pastor working in Waterford City mentioning the need for more people to share the gospel there. The church was very small back in 1981 in the Republic of Ireland. And one sentence in his article leapt out at both of us. Why don't you come over and help us? You remember St. Paul in, in the book of Acts had a very similar experience. He said, it says in Acts, when they, that's Paul and his companion, tried to enter Bithynia, the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So this was the echo in our minds. Why don't you come and help us? That was just the beginning. So we prayed and we talked with friends to see what would come of it. Was this God speaking to us, or was it just our imagination? One of the first things we did was to visit Ireland twice. We went to Waterford to meet the pastor who'd written the article, and then to Dublin to meet a friend that I'd known in college who offered to find a house for us to rent. And on both occasions, some of our kids came with us. We inquired from the Irish Baptist later who were looking for workers, but they suggested the same thing, that we seek secular work in Ireland. I applied for two jobs as a hospital biochemist in the next few months and went for interviews, but neither of them led to a job offer. Eventually, we were challenged in a home Bible study in our church from Hebrews 11. Abraham obeyed when he was called. He went out not knowing where he was going. Our eyes met across the room. And later we discovered our thoughts were the same. God was challenging us to go even though I didn't have a job and trust him for an opening once we were there. We shared this with our church leadership who were happy to stand behind us. Well, Fred found us a house to rent. When moving day arrived and all the contents of the house were packed into the removal van, it had been about two and a half years seeking God's will. People have often asked whether we were worried about the decision. All through the one verse has been in our minds from the Psalms. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Another scripture God had given us was from Ezra, when he had prayed for those returning to Jerusalem from Babylon with him, that God would lead us on our journey and protect us and our children and our possessions. Just before we went, we wrote to friends asking for prayer and said this, in the early months of this year, there were times of real confusion where we wondered what the Lord was saying. But now we can praise him for our oneness in the decision to move in this way, for the complete peace he has given us. It was a step into the unknown, but God was already there. And just in, in closing, really, just to make it complete, all that was quite a long time ago. We retired from the missionary society that we had been working with in Ireland in 2008 and were enjoying church life in Limerick. Now, sometimes God speaks when you least expect it. Many of you know our daughter has lived in God Manchester for probably 20 years and we have visited many times. On one visit in 2013, I was walking down Tudor Road and into my head came the thought, a silly thought really, because into my head said, I could live here. And I thought, that's a silly thing because lots of people live here. So if they can live here, so can I. Um, but this thought kept coming back. So was it a random idea or was God speaking? We were not expecting to leave Ireland. We were retired. We had our Irish pension. John wasn't sure whether we would be able to draw our pension when we got back here. Um, many thoughts. But the thoughts didn't go away. So we talked and prayed about it. And we made tentative steps like um, clearing out the garden shed and sorting books and photographs. And it was nearly a year that it took us before we had that, that settled sense that this was indeed God. And gradually came the confirmation from scripture coinciding with family issues that we moved back across the Irish Sea in 2014. Did we hear an audible voice from God or did we see writing in the sky? No. But we did have a growing understanding and finally a, a settled peace of mind that it was God that was leading us. Thank you. You can give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, our next, what, what you've said, what you've shared with us does link in really, really closely with what we're thinking about today with the Holy Spirit coming to help and interpret and give us a nudge every now and again from God. And we've already done a good old Charles Wesley hymn, and the next one is also a Charles Wesley hymn. And the hymn writers in that period were trying to teach folk that perhaps couldn't read the Bible because they couldn't read. And also, um, the wording of this hymn does reflect the churchy language of the time, but it fits the song, so we won't modernise it. But just to say that this is a typical Wesley hymn that explains something that gets taught in church, that explains some of the deep meaning of what we believe. And when we think of the Holy Spirit, the description is of fire, isn't it? Of flame. Do any of you remember that old song, It Only Takes a Spark to Get the Fire Going, which is about sharing your faith because of what God does for you and wanting to share that with other people? And you'll see that image throughout this hymn. And then it's about how we respond personally. And I've just been reminded of how special verse 3 is. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gift in me. So let's stand if we're able and sing, O thou who camest from above.
our next hymn has been chosen by Shirley Smith, who's here this afternoon. And uh, she's actually written an introduction for this hymn, which I will... Obviously, I'm not Shirley, so when I say I, it's Shirley saying I. I'm just reading it for her. And then after we've sung this next song, John Stevens is going to lead us in prayer. So, Shirley has said... The hymn I have chosen is Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. I have chosen this hymn because I have loved it since childhood, when I attended Teddington Methodist Church from the age of four. One day, our Sunday school teacher asked us to choose a story from the Bible and make a model of it in a shoebox. I chose Moses in the bulrushes. I think I must have made Moses out of plasticine. When I was 10, I was evacuated to Newport in South Wales, and while I was there, a bomb dropped on our beloved church and completely destroyed it. Later, I attended Duke Street Baptist Church in Richmond, Surrey, where we held a similar service to Songs of Praise in Richmond Theatre. I hope you will enjoy singing Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. So let's stand and sing this wonderful old song.
Well, as Sheena said earlier, we're thinking today about Pentecost, which is actually next weekend. And it's the Christian festival dated seven weeks after Easter, or 50 days after Passover, a Sunday that commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and followers of Jesus Christ. So here are six short prayers for Pentecost, and then afterwards we'll join together with the Lord's Prayer. So first of all, a prayer for task unfinished. Lord of the harvest, you gave your disciples the mandate to be your witnesses around the world and empowered them with your Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to accomplish this task. Today we ask that you help us to refocus our attention as we face a task unfinished. You have blessed us with the power and the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Help us to use these for ministry and witness. Amen. God of wind and fire, we celebrate today the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, which you sent upon the believers on the day of Pentecost, and which is our blessing today. Lord, we thank you for the transforming work of your Holy Spirit in our lives and through our lives towards others. We thank you that you have given us boldness to proclaim the gospel. Remind us to use your power to do the work you have given us. Amen. Breath of life on Pentecost Sunday, we ask that you breathe on us once again. Make our consciences tender to your touch. We hunger for the life-changing power that your Holy Spirit brings. May our lives exemplify the fruit of your Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. May we use the gifts of the spirits that you have distributed to bless the church and build your kingdom on earth. Amen. Joy of heaven, we are so blessed that you came to dwell in each of us on Pentecost. When your church was born, surely through your spirit we have died to sin and are alive to holiness. May we serve you faithfully in praise, prayer and loving service to others as we are changed from glory to glory. May we walk as children of the light in all goodness, righteousness and truth. Amen. Lord of power, just as the outpouring of your Holy Spirit on Pentecost so drastically changed the lives of the disciples, may the burning fire of your Holy Spirit refine and renew us so that we will never be the same. May we move in the power of the Spirit and may our lives and ministries be infused with your divine supernatural touch and authority. May the Spirit of wisdom and revelation calls us to grow in our knowledge of you. Amen. And lastly, living God, thank you for the surpassing greatness of your power to us who believe. Because you came to dwell in us on Pentecost, we have your mighty strength with which you raised Christ from the dead. Strengthen us in our inner being, so that we can know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. And now we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Thank you, John. Just before um, Sue and Richard come and do the reading for us and then Philip brings God's words to us, we're going to sing Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. And you, this song always makes me think, and I'm sure there's something that it's based on. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. So let's stand if we're able and sing that together. reading this afternoon starts in a room, and it's from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt 
and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you what is happening. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Well, thank you, Sue and Richard. For that uh, reading. Imagine what it must have been like on that day. There they were, all assembled together in a room. We don't really know where the room was. Maybe it was just a room in Jerusalem. Maybe even a room in the temple precincts. We know the disciples met there in the early days. Jesus' followers, waiting and wondering. Jesus had appeared to lots of them since his death and resurrection. Different times, different places. They knew he was alive again. They'd even witnessed his ascension, his return to heaven just 10 days before. But what next? They were there at one of the main Jewish festivals, Pentecost. We've heard that word already this afternoon, haven't we? It's one of the, it's one of the harvest festivals, their harvest celebrations. The Jews are very good at getting together to celebrate 
And uh, all those who were both Jews and those who followed the Jewish religion from other countries around had gathered together in Jerusalem for the festival. Now, before he left them, Jesus had promised them that a gift, that a gift of someone else like him, but not him, who would be with them forever. And this person would enable them to tell others about him. But he hadn't come. And they were waiting. And they were wondering. And then it happened. Out of the blue. All of a sudden. Just imagine it. First there was a sound. Like a violent wind. And then what looked like flames of fire settling on each of them. And then there was a hubbub of noise as they all started speaking at the same time. But they were speaking in languages they didn't understand. A crowd quickly gathered. All the pilgrims who'd come up to Jerusalem for the festival. And the amazing thing was, as we've heard, was that they, although they came from all the countries round about, they all understood what was being said in their own native languages. Truly miraculous. No wonder they asked what was going on, even suggesting maybe that they had had too much to drink. But we know that wasn't the case. That wasn't what was happening. Well, that's when Peter took charge and he spoke to the crowd. Now, Peter knew his Bible. He knew that this had been promised over 500 years before by one of the Old Testament prophets, that one day God would pour out his Spirit on all people, and what they were experiencing that day was just that. He went on, as we've heard in our reading, to tell them about Jesus, how he was sent from God, how he'd been put to death, but God had raised him to life again, and how he actually was the one they'd all been waiting for, as the one who was promised to be their rescuer, their Messiah, the Christ. No wonder those listening were mortified. They put him to death. What should they do? Well, Peter spelt it out to them. He said, repent. Be truly sorry for what you've done. Turn around in your thinking and believe in Jesus for yourselves. And then you'll know all that God has planned for you. And that they themselves would also receive that same Holy Spirit who they'd seen at work that very day. Now, Peter was amazingly empowered and enabled that day to speak to the crowd. Do you remember Peter, the one who denied knowing Jesus three times? The same Peter, just a little while later, was speaking to crowds of people. And as we've heard in our reading, 3,000 people believed and they were baptized and joined those early Christians. If you want to know what happened next, you need to read the rest of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's an exciting read. It tells the story of the early church over those early years. Well, we now know the same good news, and we can receive the gift of the same Holy Spirit as was promised and experienced then. Did you hear those words that uh, Richard, or was it Peter, was telling us? The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And that includes us, even today, 2,000 years later. Now, we've heard this many times this afternoon, uh, but if you look in your diaries, you'll probably find that next Sunday is called Pentecost. It's what we used to call Whitson in the old days, wasn't it? I don't know why they changed it to Pentecost. I always knew it Whitson. Anyway, it is the day when we specially remember the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's next Sunday, but we're doing it today because it fits in with our series. The coming of the Holy Spirit to those first believers, what we're celebrating today. Now, before he left them, Jesus spelt out to them some of the things that the Holy Spirit would do when he came. How he would be a helper to them. How he would be one who came alongside them to live with them and to teach them, especially about him. That he would be the one who would lead them and guide them through their lives. And what was promised then can be true for us. He can be our helper. He can come alongside us. He can teach us all about Jesus, and he can lead us and guide us through our lives. He's also the one who convinces us about the truth, 
about ourselves. And if we're honest with ourselves, I guess we know this. We know we need God's forgiveness. All of us do. And we know we can only know God's forgiveness as we put our faith and trust in Jesus for our salvation. So that when our time comes to leave this world, we can be ready to meet God for ourselves. This is the work, or some of the work, of the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate his, his coming next Sunday. But we can do it any day, can't we? Now, you know, the Holy Spirit is what we call part of the Trinity. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, but three persons, each with a different role to play. Now, if you find it difficult to understand, join the club, because theologians have wrestled with this for hundreds of years, how we can have one God, three persons, not three gods, one God, three persons. Don't come and ask me to explain it later on. Go and ask Richard, he might know. No, I don't suppose he will. It's a mystery. It really is a mystery, but it's true. We believe it's true. One God, three persons. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> but we worship one God. The creator of the universe. If you look in your Bibles, at the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, you'll see all three persons were there at the beginning. We find the Holy Spirit was moving across the waters, and Jesus was there. Believe it or not, Jesus didn't just come into existence 2,000 years ago. He was there. The Son of God was there with the Father and the Spirit right at the very beginning. Difficult to understand? I agree. But I can still believe it. And I suggest you can as well. So we worship one God, the eternal creator of the universe. But Jesus, the son, he was born as a human being just about 2,000 years ago. Yes, he lived on this earth as a real human being. Also God at the same time. Difficult to understand that as well. But we believe it's true. He lived, he died, he rose again, and then he returned to heaven. And we can know him now as our saviour and Lord and our God. So just as after the events we've heard about today, in the reading we've had, we found that the Holy Spirit came so powerfully upon those early disciples and he can come to us as well and live with us and enable us to do things maybe that we don't think we can do. Even like going to Ireland and living there for 30 years or so and then coming back again or even going away and coming back to your home. Lots of things. The Holy Spirit can just prompt us and guide us and lead us. And as Di and John said, we don't always hear voices, audible voices, or see anything, lights in the sky, but we can know that God is prompting us to do things in our minds, in our hearts, and that can be his uh, speaking to us by his Holy Spirit. So as we think about the events of that particular Pentecost many years ago, when the Holy Spirit came in power, all part of God's big plan for his world, I pray that we may realise the significance for us today, individually. You see, God hasn't changed. What happened 2,000 years ago can happen today, not in exactly the same way. The Holy Spirit is still around today. He is God, God living with us and in us. And he always will be. So the one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these three persons who are God, they are for us, the Father loves us, the Son who died for us, and the Holy Spirit who comes to live within us and to be our helpers. He is the one who we can experience today in our lives. You may think that sounds really weird. It is unusual, but it is true. We believe that this is the truth of God, that we can know God by his Holy Spirit day by day, and he's the one who can help us, he can guide us, he can prompt us, he can help us tell other people about Jesus, and he can help us to live a life which is pleasing to him. And my prayer is that each one of us might know more and more of that in our lives day by day. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray together, then we're going to sing our last hymn. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your love, you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to die for each one of us, so we might know your forgiveness. And we thank you that you, help, you sent the Holy Spirit to help us to understand these truths and then to live with us, to be our helper. May we know you in all your fullness and your power day by day. Amen. Now, our last hymn reminds us of our journey through this life to that place where God is waiting for us.
and how he wants to guide each one of us to that place one day. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. So if you're able to, let's stand and sing this great hymn together. Do have a seat. Well, we've been on quite a journey this afternoon, haven't we? <laughs> we've been in a room where everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago and all those amazing things that happened. I've been taken back to Sunday school. Thank you, Shirley, because I used to love that hymn as well, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, and it just made me think of, do you remember the felt I used to love when they told us a story and they put the felt characters up on the board. And I remember making, <laughs> I remember making paper palms as well for Palm Sunday. So that's taken me right back to Dorset when I was eight. And that last hymn's taken us to the Welsh Valleys, hasn't it? So we've been <laughs> all over the place this afternoon. And just to sort of following on from that, I um, want to advertise the fact that uh, the Rehoboth orphanage in the Philippines. Thank you. Um, we've got a stall out in the f foyer there to raise, with some bits and pieces on sale, very reasonable, I have to say, to raise some funds for the orphanage. And I didn't just bring this to advertise. I thought on the way in, I'm going to need a fan. We've been promised a heat wave. And this is just one of the items that you can, you can buy. Um, on Tuesday coming at 10 o'clock, there's Tuesday Extra, which is a short service before Tuesday Treat. So do come along if you're able. And our next Songs of Praise is on the 18th of June. So it would be lovely to see you then. And do stop and have tea with us and enjoy the meal and enjoy the fellowship with each other. Um, and thank you to all the people who've been preparing that for us and are going to service in a moment. Thank you, too, to everyone who's taken part today. There's so much goes into putting these services together, and there's so many people involved, so thank you all. And to our techie people at the back, <laughs> because without them, you wouldn't be able to hear us, apart from anything else. So um, thank you all for your contributions. So let's just finish off with a, a short prayer, and I'll include grace for those that are going to have tea. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder of all that you've done for us and that you've given us the helper, the Holy Spirit, to help us, to guide us, to support us and give us 
the nudge we need sometimes to live the life that you want us to live and to do the things that you want us to do. Thank you for the stories of the impression that you've made on people in the past, of Di and John's work in Northern Ireland and how they ended up coming back, of all the stories in the Bible of people's experience of listening and obey, listening to you and obeying you. And we just pray now that that spark that you've planted in our hearts, that fire that, that you've shared with us, that we'll be able to have the strength and the faith and the resilience to keep that going and to share your love and your purpose with other people who are dear to us, those we know, those we don't, but help us to share that light and that power that you bring. And dear Lord, as we come together to share a meal, we thank you for the way you provide for us. We thank you for the food for our bodies and we thank you for those who have prepared it for us. We just ask that you will bless us all and keep us safe and keep us close to you in this coming week. For we ask it in your dear name. Amen. Thank you.